I live here on this small farm about an hour south of Nashville. And I was fixing up this old farmhouse, and so I joined the Historic Society here in Murray County. And while I was there, they gave me a newsletter that happened to be printed that particular month. And when I was reading it, sitting in the room, there were these letters that were reprinted in there from John Robison writing to his wife, Josephine. And something about those letters really touched me and inspired me because he clearly loved his wife and his children. And so I found myself um, sometime later in a hotel room with my guitar thinking about those letters and a song just came out called Josephine and it was written from John's perspective and it was really like a letter home to his wife. And once we made the music video, everyone on our team started talking about the potential of making a movie. Like everyone wanted to make a movie except for me. I thought the story was fully told. There was nothing else that I felt like we needed to say about John or about Josephine because they were covered in the letters. But someone who had seen the music video a couple years later sent me an email and they had excerpts from some letters from Josephine that she had written to John. And again, they were very poetic and beautiful. I never lie down at night, but what I think, where is my loved one tonight? Is he standing somewhere chilled with cold? Or is he lying on the cold ground thinly covered? And is he lying somewhere on the battlefield, cold and deathless? What if Josephine didn't hear from her husband? And what if she had to take it into her own hands to go find him? We just had that little bit of an idea, like what if she's at home and she has to cut her hair and basically become a man and go find her husband. So we rushed back here to the farmhouse and we sat down with our computers and we started writing. And in about three or four hours, a large part of the film unfolded. It was, it was an unbelievable feeling to be able to sit down and write and to throw ideas back and forth. And because Rory and I are so much alike in so many different ways, it actually made it really neat to be able to write together. Marks laughs, does whatever. He doesn't even think about it. Ah. Bam! Stop! You know? And then it's quiet. We thought if her story captivated us, it might be something someone else wanted to see too. And I remember leaning over to Aaron, he was sitting next to me and telling him, we need to make it this spring. I got this feeling we need to do it now. And of course he was ready to go, so he said, yeah. I'm in, man, sign me up, let's do this. And, um, and then reality hits. Because none of us had ever done that before. And though we had read tons of books and we'd watched tons of videos and we asked lots of questions, it's still a matter of figuring it out as you go. I had a lot of people who had made feature films before say to me, you don't even know. You don't know the half of what you're stepping into. And so we immediately put the wheels in motion and said we're going to move to Virginia in March and start filming in April. And that's what we did. We took as many of our friends and our family as we could with us but also all our extended family, our bus driver, and of course Aaron, who's the writer, producer with me. He, he's my cousin, my daughter, both of my daughters, my wife, um, my little bitty baby daughter also. And even though my wife has been the focus of our career, she really is the singer and she's the smile and she's even more beautiful than me, believe it or not. And. Um, She's been the focus and the attention all the time, but when it came time to make this film, she wanted to be in the background. She just said, I want to be a wife and a mama, and I want to help in any way I can. I want to support you, no matter how long that is. And it was months and months that she did that. So when we moved to Virginia, it wasn't just the crew, it was also my family moved. And my wife would make dinners and breakfast for all of us and take care of us. And when times were hard, she was there beside me uh, on the scariest days, the times when I didn't think that I was going to get through it or we were going to get through it. And it's not only family, it's our, our friends who are like family to us, like Gabe McCauley, who's a producer on the film. Head of moral support. First moral support? Yeah, first moral support PA. Assistant to the PA. <laughs> Another family member that's not a family member is 
Brian Allen, BA, and he's a cinematographer. Hold on, you're a director, not a cinematographer. Yeah, but we, we, should, ha we don't have to do that. We should switch sides. You... Now, he's the. Uh, hold on, the hold D on, it's gotta be creative. <laughs> the guy behind that camera right there is the DP. And Daniel, who, man, Dan just does everything for us and with us. I'm supposed to be offloading cards and editing, you know, cutting together dailies so that our esteemed director can look at them. But, uh, but instead I've been kind of like a camera assistant plus video village. But what he is to me is like my little brother. And so for me to be able to work alongside him on this film, it, it's priceless. There were quite a few times where we were looking for locations and one thing I didn't understand about filmmaking is that you'll have a base camp and you need to find as many locations right near the base camp as you can because I'd be like well let's just go 12 miles that way and 37 miles that way and I soon realized that we needed to be as close as possible and so once we figured that out we started looking at campsites here and different things and we were walking one particular day looking for the spot where Josephine was going to come upon the Union soldier who had just cracked his head on a tree. And we needed a particular tree that had fallen down and was laying, you know, at about chest height. And when we came across it, we we're like, there it is. This is the one. And so it was kind of surreal when you imagine that, you kind of walk through it together. You imagine that he's going to fall right here and she's going to be standing over top of him right here. And then to come back with a full crew and the actors and shoot it and create it right there on the spot to see it come to life, it's, it's a pretty magical thing. And that people could be walking across, we could either have another campfire, we could light it like there's another, if it's 12 guys, maybe a couple of the guys are over there, maybe somebody's walking out here, just so it feels like some movement out here. Okay. So this is definitely one of the campsites. We are uh, putting stakes at all of our locations and then setting GPS coordinates so that we can send them to people to find the different places that we're filming. So we're actually setting where the scenes are that we're shooting today. Slave House is scene 26. Hi, my name is Heidi. I'm the director's assistant. Actually, you're the assistant to the director. I'm the assistant director. Actually, you know, on paper, you're the assistant. I'm the assistant director. Okay. <laughs> Aaron and I and Heidi and Daniel and Thomas, we came upon this old tobacco marn that was just covered over in tin and weeds and snakes and stuff. And we looked at it and we thought, this could be perfect. But we knew it was, it was a lot to turn it into a slave cabin. We looked over at Thomas and Thomas was like, I can do that. Give me two days. One beam bowed in yeah. a little bit. I'm just wondering if you could just do a board on Oops. the inside, bottom to top, you know? As yeah. long as you don't see it when we're in there. Yeah. And I'll be darned if he didn't. He built a floor in it and a porch and put a door and windows and everything else in it. One of my favorite parts of the movie making experience was the casting experience. First of all, I love Erica Arvald and her team. They did an incredible job. And we had made plans to go and see her while we were on a scouting trip in Virginia, but we weren't sure we were going to get the chance. And at the last minute, Russell and Aaron and I headed north to Charlottesville, and that was the greatest stop we could have made. Because at that moment, our film just was elevated so much just by all of her experience and her wisdom and insight and casting and her staff. And we just knew when we met her, like, this is going to change everything. Yes, closed. Waiting, waiting to hear back from these two right now. When I heard the concept, the idea of a woman disguising herself as a soldier to find her husband, I was already in. Complete hook, line, and sinker. When we first saw Alice's audition tape, it was pretty clear that that was done on an iPhone, maybe in the back of someone's house. It turned out that her husband is the one who filmed it. And you can't tell nobody. I know what it is to pretend to be something you're not. I know what it is to pretend to be something you're not. 
I, I literally did one take of each scene, which is really unusual. Like normally I'm going over it and stressing about it. And um, I think that was in the writing that um, the character just came to life very easily off the page. When Alice showed up, she was not only an amazing actress, she was an amazing person. And we talked to her about what she was comfortable with, the physical aspects of the role, and there was nothing that she didn't want to do. As a female actor, it was um, an exciting role to think about playing, um, because it's playing a woman who's very strong and um, goes on a very kind of exciting, powerful journey in a way that I don't think women are depicted in cinema that often, or not often enough anyway. When Boris showed up and put Boris into the scene, we just fell in love with him. And I remember both of us feeling like, I love this guy. Well, you, you read, there's so much that you read in your face that it seems like you can go from, from humor to pretty serious to quite a few things just in, you know, in one short amount of time. Uh, you don't read a script this good and and not be inspired by it. Um, you, we, as actors, are often reading different scripts of all sorts, TV, film, stage, whatnot, and this struck me so quickly. It's very beautifully intimate and yet quite almost poetic. And when you're dead, it's over. There's nothing else. All this living and dying and loving and crying bullshit won't mean nothing. And there ain't no hoping or wishing gonna bring you back. When I saw Jesse James's audition for Marx. I mean, I was just knocked out, and Rory was knocked out. We just, we just stared at the screen and were like, I mean, that is Marx. There was just no doubt about it. Because the lieutenant is a damn coward. And this train is headed south. He was scary. And he really didn't do much. He wasn't very physical. It was like all in his eyes and his voice. One pair of boots. And one rifle for bayonet. Being given this uh, is, is truly a dream come true. I don't want to give any spoilers away, but when I read the entire script and read where my character had to go, uh, it was a no-brainer for me. For Hickory Films and pre-production, we had never done a film before. So we didn't even know what pre-production was. And for me as a producer, it meant hiring a lot of people, for instance, and, and learning their jobs as I'm, you know, talking with them. I am always working in this arena, I'm always working often at a budget, a television budget, or a, or a tighter, limited, independent film budget. So I knew that I could help Aaron and Rory doing their first film, a period film. So I knew that my team and I could bring our expertise, our knowledge base, and our background to help them get Josephine to the screen. I just mean green officer. That doesn't make me say green officer. Okay. That makes me say veteran officer. What well, is that? That's why. Why? No, he's short jacket, shell jacket. Well, what are the that's other guys what's wearing? What's that's what all the enlisted men are wearing, the shell jacket. Even keeping to that historical truth and honesty, I know that we were able to stick to the performances and stick to the, uh, the story uh, and give Aaron and Rory even more than they, I think they were expecting. We're gonna sew the buttons on so they're easy to pop and then we're gonna have to reset them every time. I'm the assistant prop master and I'm dressing the set with some prime fresh eggs. These eggs are actually really farm fresh, they still have feathers still on them. We want um, just personality in here. If we can have some in these areas, that's what we really want. Uh, we had to put flooring in there and then texture it and color it up to make it look not like it's brand new plywood and something that's from the period. We had to dress it, bring everything in from the tiny tin cups, shaving brushes, tables, chairs, whole nine yards. One of the great things about this project, it's a first time writer, it's a first time director. And one of the things that's nice about working with people that have not done it is they're not stuck in old norms. So even with working in film and television for 17 years, you, you bring, I definitely know I'm gonna bring something to the table. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's no, that, that was good. That, right? that was yeah. good, that was great, that was great. Boom. Oh, oh, oh 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that's good, yeah. And then good, like, pull it. Yeah, there you go. But then again, I'm bringing to the table what's always been done. And what ends up happening is new people come into a project and they bring new eyes and they bring new concepts. They bring new ways of using technology. They just bring just fresh, exciting stuff. Like this, and just right, just off to the side. Well, no, actually, actually just, and, then, and don't go all the way through. It was a little nerve-wracking knowing that Alice was going to cut her hair in real life and you only got one take and one opportunity to shoot it. We, we were set and ready. She had to bring it in one take and she really, really did. I, I was very nervous about it but I was also excited about it and it very much felt like, because some people were, you know, said, couldn't you wear a wig or something, but it was so important to me to go through as much as possible what Josephine would have had to go through and just doing something drastic like cutting your hair because it was it was tough to do and it was scary but it changed me and it changed how I looked and it changed how I felt you know something as simple as cutting your hair can do that and that really helped me to find the character. When she was done and she had cut her hair I mean we were all kind of shaken a little bit because we could see that she was really taking that character on a hundred percent. Wardrobe standing by with towel. Prop truck is here ready to deep prop. Yes, sir. I am basically in charge of the set. I'm the one that delivers all the elements, yeah. making sure it was in place, making sure we're all uh, propped up. Set dressing is in. Actors are in place. I deliver the set to Rory. Hey, water's coming up. Uh, my name is Bradford and I'm the B camera operator. B camera is the second camera that we'll run so we'll use it for a lot of tight shots and uh, a lot of like we have in the background there, jib, movie, any handheld stuff that we're doing. We're kind of like just using it as every other every other shot besides Dolly. <laughs> and I'm going 85 on. Oh, you're going to get both of them. No, that's what I'm saying. Look. Then yes. I swing to a 35. And, and we take to his 50. 50. Yeah. And then we're going to get covered on both And then you and I can both just get that. That's it. He wants doing? my job. He does. He really does. My name is Nick. I'm first AC, which means I am on camera for Josephine. I am pulling focus. I'm getting everything good to look for Brian, who is DP. Hi, I'm Allie, and I'm the script supervisor. And I take notes on all the shots that we get, and I keep all these guys in check. For the slave shack scene, we've got just a campfire out front and then a haze machine inside just to add a little bit of atmosphere inside and it picks up the shafts of light that are coming through the building and things like that. We found ourselves all nervous because it was a hard scene to film. It hurt us. It hurt us to have to film that scene. And our actors were amazing. They were all so loving. It seemed like they were all scary when, when you see the film, but they were so loving to each other, even Jesse James and Sergeant Marks. So it was kind of a strange thing for us to see it come to life. It was exciting and also heartbreaking for us at the same time because we knew it was gonna be a hard scene. But when it was done, we could tell something special had happened there. I am the sound mixer and recorder for the set. Uh, right now I'm working on a lav mic that we're going to hide under clothing. And uh, we have to... Uh, Rig it up so that it doesn't make a whole lot of noise when it's on a person. DA Bob says he can't use it because of the rocking sound that's going on. You know, we had a lot of scenes where we were relying on visual effects. And we hired a kid that had done some films before, but he came fresh out of college, uh, Zach Rogers. Hey. See the screen screen right here? See Sorry. That? 
That's how you make a movie right there. That's how you, that's a movie making right there. And man, he nailed it. We had a train up here when it was just literally one boxcar that we made on the back of a hay wagon. And all of a sudden that became a train on train tracks. I ain't going to Virginia. This train is headed south, Georgia. Most of our team from Nashville had been doing music and video production for years, but this was our first time to be part of something so big. I'm gonna have to put Camp Bristol behind these trees, these foreground trees. Yeah. We were constantly seem like fighting limitations of not just budget and time, but more than that, the elements didn't want to cooperate. And then Josephine starts walking through the campsite. She walks by a card game, she walks by a barber shop kind of thing. She walks by the guy with the dog, um, and then Rose's tent, and then the photographer tent. And then after the photographer tent, she, yeah, all that happens right there. Just make sure those four end up in the center. We'd hoped to have a hundred or more tents for the filming of the Camp Bristol scene, but all we could afford were maybe a dozen or so. So as you can imagine, it took some serious creative thinking to turn the resources we had available into the sets we needed. But it happened. Just a few green screens and some well-placed trees, and we were pretty much able to make it look like we had more than we actually had. And as she's going through this monologue, we're on the other side and we're filming Jesse James, who's Marx. And we're just watching him react to her story. And I remember just thinking, this is a magic moment. Like, I just loved everything about what he did instinctually. And we only had, you know, like two minutes to get that whole scene. We just stopped it right there. He only had to do it once. You could just tell it was perfect. I love that scene. Finally, after two weeks of filming, it was time for the big battle. You've got the full crew, you've got special effects, you've got explosions, you've got safety, you know, I mean, I mean, it's a high, high, high pressure day already. Guns going off, mortars going off. The actors are going to be doing all of their own action. And so today we're just going to make sure everybody stays safe, but really does it with a high level of energy so that uh, it is an effective scene. It was exciting to finally be here, also a bit terrifying. There were so many things that could go wrong, so many things to figure out. And again, we had very little time to pull it all off. You know, you do up here, then you're back yeah, down yeah. like this. What's that? So the dialogue is sort of over yeah. each other's shoulders. But well, we won't have cameras on this side. Well, then, and guys, you've got to be really yeah, careful with these ramrods and close traps. Are you see how close more is? Big bayonet explode. Big bayonet explode. Then he says, charge. Hashtag charge! The way the ending had been written, Josephine had kind of gone on this journey of becoming a man, essentially, and that had, while I was filming, that felt like it, you know, having to have to cut my own hair and wear an army uniform every day and be running around in the trenches, and I just don't think the ending is, is quite right for the journey of the script. But I felt like Josephine must have changed as a character and I was nervous about approaching Rory and Aaron and saying that this bit in your story that um, is amazing, so of course you must feel attached to that we think maybe should could be better. So we didn't know what the ending ought to be, we, but we felt strong enough about the script and love it enough that we thought he, we've got to present this to him. And in presenting it to him, 
He listened amazingly. Well, I got a text from Rory at like five in the morning or something saying, I thought of a new ending. And I got to set the next morning and he just said, now that we've talked about it, I can never go back. <laughs> and that's the ending that he so easily and lovingly, because of his baby, his script, agreed to. And we didn't know, we just knew that he, there was more to what he was giving us, and that's all. And he, he came back with a home run. <laughs> For Aaron and I to have written a story that goes all the way through, and the big moment is when she finds her husband. That's the moment that we're all waiting for. Like that's when the story seems to come full circle. Just looking at them looking at each other, there were a lot of emotions going on between those two, but you should have seen the emotions on our faces. I'm sitting there next to Rory and Dan and a couple of other people and we're watching it and we're like, oh my gosh, they're nailing it. It's beautiful, it's incredible. It was a big deal for us to see that come to life and to see how it come to life because it's been a long time to get there, and they did such an amazing job, both Mitch and Alice, and I think it's going to go down as being one of the most important scenes we've ever filmed, even if we get to make lots of movies in the future. I think that's one that's still going to st stand out in our mind. And now that we've got the film edited and we're here, I, I can't believe it, actually. I, I, I'm just blown away. I'm so honored to be part of it, and I'm proud of it. Looking back now, after all this time, and thinking about changing the ending and uh, how kind and sweet Alice and Boris were about it, I, I love that. And I love that they made the film better. They made the last scene better, but it turns out that that wasn't the ending at all. After we finished filming, and we wrapped, and we came back to Tennessee, quite a few things happened. My wife, who had been with us there the whole time, ended up uh, getting diagnosed with cancer again. And this time it was not looking good. And so we had to put the film on hold for a long time. And we were in hospitals all across the country and chemo and therapy. And then we went home to Indiana to where my wife is from and spent the last five months there with her. And then, little by little, we started trying to get back together and see where the film was. We loved what we had shot. We loved the story that we told, and yet it felt like something was missing. And we finally figured out what it was right here at this desk in Joey's in my bedroom. And that is the truth of the story. How the story came to be in the first place. The story of how I bought this old rundown farmhouse it was in such bad shape. And then believing it could be turned into something beautiful and, and the girls and I living here and then me getting to read these letters from John and Josephine and being inspired to not only write a song, but to have a love story like theirs. And then to go on and, and meet Joey, whose nickname is Josephine, and, and then get to share in this incredible journey with her. Just we get to have a music career and we get to make a music video for the song. There's just so much true life and love and magic in it. And when we finally realized that, that that's the part of the story that was missing, we came back and together our whole crew assembled here on the farm and we shot the footage one morning three years later of me sharing some of that story and going on my own journey down the road from the farmhouse and revisiting Josephine one last time while I tell my story and getting back here and going for a walk to the cemetery with Indiana. I'm just right out there. And we as filmmakers and as a team came to understand the real meaning which is that people 
who were here in this community more than a hundred years before we lived here impacted our lives greatly. They inspired our love story. Even after my wife is gone and maybe after we're gone someday that we might impact other people's lives too. That's such a beautiful thought and to be able to capture that, and share a little bit of that um, in the film was really special after all this time. It took a movie that we loved and turned it into a movie and a story that we're gonna treasure forever.